Welcome. My name is Salpi Razarian. I'm the director of the USC Institute of Armenian Studies. This is the sixth or seventh of our luncheon talks this academic year. I think it may, in fact, be the last one. Jishtem Clara. I think so. Um, so it's a kind of great way to end the year, um, given the nature of our guest and the nature of the conversation. Uh, this is the 100th year of the Armenian Genocide. This is the event that is being commemorated around the world through conferences, concerts, lectures, exhibits. Um, here at SC, we are ha holding several programs together with the Armenian Students Association, together with the Shoah Center for Advanced Genocide Research. Uh, we have developed a website called year100.org, which is a directory of events around the world, focusing on scholarship, publications, websites, exhibits, to demonstrate the variety of top, uh, ways of commemorating and the variety of individuals, speakers, artists, scholars who are engaged in the process of commemoration in every country in the world. This semester, uh, as part of the two-unit colloquium that we teach on you know, issues having to do with Armenian cultural and social issues, we invited Robert Koptash from Istanbul to be a guest lecturer and to talk about Armenian-Turkish relations and its evolution over the last 100 years. Today, that is more or less the topic, and we called it, uh, unbeknownst to us, with a title that's very similar to the title that was used to remember Auschwitz. And I guess that's not unusual given the similarities of the issues involved. We called it the past is the present, or the past and the present in Armenian-Turkish relations. Robert Koptash was for many years editor of the Agos Weekly newspaper, a newspaper both in Turkish and Armenian, that was founded by Hrant Dink, the journalist, community activist who was assassinated in early 2007, specifically for his journalism and his activism. Uh, Robert was editor after uh, that assassination, and today he's no longer with the newspaper, but. He is editor of a small publishing house that was founded at about the same time as Agos uh, and that deals with publishing Turkish language works on Armenian literature, politics, and history. Uh, we've invited Mark Cooper, professor of journalism here at the Annenberg School, to be in conversation with Robert Koptash. Mark and I go way back. Can I tell them how far back? Long time, 30 some years. Mark was one of the rare journalists who in the 70s and 80s, in the years when Armenians resorted to all sorts of methods and means to revive memory of the genocide, Mark was one of the rare journalists who got it, who understood the issue, understood its relevance to us thousands of miles and decades away. And uh, we respected his work. Mark uh, is a professor of journalism now. He's been a writer and journalist for decades, uh, tough topics, worked as editor at The Nation, ran uh, Pacifica News Services News Bureau, especially the KPFK News Service decades ago. And before that was translator and foreign press rep of sorts to uh, Chilean President Salvador Allende before his assassination. So politics isn't easy anywhere. I, it doesn't matter which continent. I'm very pleased and proud that these are our two guests today. And we have just a little bit under an hour to listen to them. Thank you both. This is being live streamed if you want to share that information or after the program share that information. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Salpi. Well, I'm, I'm pleased to be here to speak to Robert because, um, as Salpi mentioned, this is the 100th uh, anniversary. April 24th is the 100th anniversary of the first genocide. Unfortunately, there were many uh, in the 20th century, but it was the first uh, one of horrific scale. Um, uh, with, I, I imagine it's still a matter of debate, but uh, well over a million or perhaps two million uh, Armenians were murdered uh, in the chaos of uh, World War I by uh, the Turkish government. Uh, and this, of course, the, this uh, genocide 
has dominated, and I don't speak as an Armenian, but it's clear from those who know the Armenian community that this issue of genocide has understandably dominated uh, Armenian discourse and Armenian identity uh, for the last hundred years. And I'm pleased to be able to speak to Robert today because we're going to try and go a little bit beyond that. Uh, it's very, I don't mean this in a callous way, because uh, uh, I'm part of the Jewish diaspora. Uh, it's uh, from that Holocaust, but uh, it, 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 so not in a facile way. I'll say it's, it's easy to condemn a genocide and to talk about the genocide itself. Uh, but it's very difficult to talk about what comes after that and how do you move forward. And um, the Jewish diaspora and the Armenian diaspora are not comparable. They have many differences. Um, their common point, as we discussed before, is the genocide itself. But they've played out, those communities, those diasporas, have played out very differently. So we're going to talk today with Robert, who has the um, unique position of being a Turkish Armenian, which is a little bit like being a modern uh, German Jew, um, with the difference that he lives in a country where uh, the genocide has not really been fully recognized. So let, let's just begin there with um, with what it's like to be, I, you said there's about 50,000 Armenians who live in Turkey. How do they live? How are they identified? What kind of space do they have to exercise their, their identity and their politics? Uh, so thank you so much. You're welcome. And thank you for the uh, invitation coming from Salfi Ghazarian, the di director of University of Southern California Armenian Studies Institute. Uh, I, it, it is a pleasure to be here. It was a pleasure to lecture uh, to USC students. Some of them are here. Thank you so much. It was very uh, quite a good experience for me uh, to be in LA, uh, the, maybe the center of the Armenian diaspora, uh, and sharing my that unique experience as a Turkish Armenian. Uh, that unique experience, unique experience is shared by 50,000 Armenians living in Turkey. Uh, and of course, it's, it's different. If it's, uh, I must admit that it's hard. It's very difficult to be an Armenian in Turkey. Uh, but that dif difficulty is maybe not so unique because being and living in Turkey is not so easy for <laughs> other ethnic groups and other minorities as well. Uh, because uh, Turkish Republic founded in 1923, some 95 years ago, 90 years ago, uh, was based on some crimes against humanity uh, occurred during the World War I. Yes. Uh, the mainly the Armenian genocide, and we can add that uh, Assyrian genocide, which Assyrians call it SAFO, uh, it, the Assyrian word for sword. Uh, it was a hard time for whole minorities, especially non-Muslim communities of Ottoman Empire. And then population exchange came, the Greek people, 1.4 million Greeks of Ottoman Empire sent to the Greece. It, it was a huge, devastating deportation. And the Turkish Republic uh, founded after these events. Uh, and the Republican history is full of discrimination, uh, segregation against non-Muslim minorities of the country. Uh, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk founded a modern Western style secular uh, new state, which was applauded by the Western countries most of the time because that's a backward looking Ottoman Empire gone and new secular uh, republic emerged. Uh, it was applauded. But uh, nobody demanded the kind of democracy, justice, equality from Republican Turkey. That was a main, one of the main problems. 
uh, of the Turkish history. And that's why I believe Turkish uh, state uh, didn't feel the need of democratizing itself. Uh, and it was a, it aimed to create a monolithic uh, society, monolithic on the base of uh, e ethnicity. Uh, and the Turkish ethnic identity was praised and all the other ethnic identities were downed. Uh, of course, the Armenian, Greek, Jewish, uh, or Kurdish, or some other Arab, because the Ottoman Empire was more pluralistic than the Turkish uh, Republic, and uh, Turkish states transformed its, itself into a national state without accepting that there was some other ethnic groups, some other languages, some other religions. Uh, it was the main problem. And, uh, the sufferings were, were not only belonging to the Armenians, and uh, we, we know that the Kurdish problem still continues in Turkey. And even we can say that some Muslim majority of the country faced lots of problems because uh, the state, the secular Kemalist Western state forced them uh, to change their uh, traditional beliefs and belief system into a more secular one. That's why, for instance, we discussed about this in our uh, lectures. They even changed the language of Azan, the uh, Muslim call for prayer, into Turkish, which was for 100 years, it was Arabic, of course. Uh, that's why Muslim majority, even them, uh, felt themselves uh, suffered and a victim of that modern state. And again, we, we can see that the problem still continues because only after 2002, when today's government uh, won the elections and uh, came into power, some of the problems, like headscarf problem, uh, solved in these last five years. Because, for instance, before that, before today's government, uh, the women wearing headscarves cannot go to the universities, right. cannot be state officials. Right. So this is a kind of um, history of violence and history of the uh, distortion of history. Well, let, let, let's talk about the um, uh, historical dividing line of, uh, of uh, the last decade or so. Mm -hmm. uh, prior to the 2002 uh, election, uh, under the secular state, uh, there was very little uh, uh, international pressure exerted on Turkey to democratize because it was seen as, as by the United States for most of the Cold War as a strategic uh, base really for the United States uh, to contain uh, the Soviets. Uh, but we have this very odd situation and it's very difficult to, uh, I, I will say as a journalist, it's a, it's a disgrace to uh, American journalism, that American journalism is so narrow uh, and really ignores the world. I'm sorry, but it ignores it. Uh, and when it focuses on it, it's usually through an American prism. So we have this extremely, at least from an American strategic point of view, if nothing else, we have this extremely important pivotal nation in Turkey about which we know nothing or very little is reported. Uh, having said all that, um, you have a, an election, you have a new government that comes in in 2002, which was actually an elected uh, democratic government that represents a Muslim majority. It becomes, in a sense, one of the two or three most democratic Muslim nations in the world. Um, and yet in the last, it's a zigzag, in the last couple of years we've seen, last two or three years, we've seen a drift towards authoritarianism. Um, so how has um, this new period, well you have two new periods, you have 2002 till maybe 2011 and then 2011 to, to now, uh, how does that affect the Armenians and the Turks? Mm -hmm. yeah. As you said, uh, Turkey um, quite benefited from the Cold War 
because geostrategically it was so important, a very important uh, place in the world map, yeah. close to the Soviet Union, close to the Middle East, to, close to the petrol, uh, uh, close to the Europe as well. Uh, that's why Turkey played a quite good politics, made a good <coughs> diplomacy, uh, sometimes getting closing to the Soviet Union, sometimes to, to the Western Bloc, and of course, US and the Western Bloc uh, didn't risk to lose them to Soviets. Uh, that's why uh, nobody pushed Turkey to be a democratic country until 1990s when the Soviet Union collapsed and Turkey tried to be uh, in, um, a member of EU. Uh, I have to say, thanks to EU and that process, uh, Turkey became more vulnerable to foreign pressure about democratization. Uh, and in 90s, we experienced this. Uh, first, Kurds uh, opened the way for their rights as uh, Turkish citizens uh, and demanded some rights, for instance, using their languages in schools or textbooks or uh, printing the Kurdish books opening Kurdish televisions, and this was for, forbidden. Uh, today, it's, it's okay. They have some rights. Uh, and I have to say that this is quite the result of that foreign pressure, and with the of course, with the help of inner change, inner, inner social transformation went on after, after 90s. Uh, and when AKP, AK Party government today's Islamic government came into power at, in 2002. Uh, for me and for most of the um, liberal-minded intellectuals in the Turkey and around the world, uh, it was a um, sign of normalization of the country, because before that the mainstream politics was uh, under the hegemony of the army. Uh, and the principles that set by Mustafa Kemal Atatürk eight years ago. Yeah. Uh, first time a Muslim majority party gained power in politics uh, and represented its own people. Uh, and this was, of course, a normalization. For the uh, Western eyes, maybe it was a risk. And for the most of the secular uh, Turkish citizens, who were living mostly in the western side of the country, at the seaside mostly, and by class they were higher. Uh, it was a threat because they thought that Turkey will return to an Islamic country, Islamic state, like, for instance, Iran. Right. Uh, but in the first years, Erdogan and its governments uh, made a quite good job about changing the uh, political discourse, and they made lots of reforms, as you said, uh, and they were in cooperation with the European countries. Uh, but when they, uh, I believe that when they believed that the army is over and they won that game, that power game, are, and they sent the army to their barracks, uh, we, this can be at uh, 2010 after the referendum about constitution and they won with a, a high, quite high percentage. Uh, they felt that they are okay now, no risk about the political uh, military intervention, no risk about military coup. And uh, as you said, Prime Minister Erdogan, now he's the president and his mentality, his perception of the world, his authoritarianism, uh, uh, gained an hegemony in the politics. That's well, the main change in these uh, two periods. Well, how do you see then, uh, because we're going to get to this in a minute, because I think you don't see yourself only as an Armenian, uh, I don't think. I see myself only nothing. <laughs> okay. I'm lots uh, of things. Uh, but. But politically, you're as interested in Turkey as you are, say, in the plight of the Armenian diaspora. So we'll we'll get to that in a minute. But let me well we'll get to it through this question. Do you think that the uh, current uh, climate that we see under the president 
which is recognized universally as a, a negative drift. Do you see this as something that is uh, a, a, a sort of a semi-permanent long-term shift in Turkish politics that's, that's not going to be reversed for some time? Or is it a more complicated, the only, the only thing that comes to my mind, this is really remote, I'm sorry, but as I get old, I think of more and more remote analogies. Uh, you had a very ambiguous situation, for example, in, in Argentina in the 1950s when you had somebody like Perón who was becoming both more authoritarian and yet in some ways the society was uh, becoming more democratic. I mean, it's very contradictory. Do you, are these processes of democratization and the peculiarities of your president compatible or is this a, a major shift now that, that, that makes you pessimistic? Yeah, this is an excellent question. And I believe that uh, it's quite familiar with the uh, uh, Peron example. Ah. Yeah. That's not so crazy. Uh, be <laughs> <laughs> right. Because I don't think that Erdogan and his party was so white when Washington or Western media were applauding themselves with uh, high praises. Uh, and now I don't believe that they are so black that most of the Western media is blaming. Uh, the truth is on the gray zones, and Turkey is a big country and a very chaotic one. It is uh, very difficult to understand even people uh, living there. And for West, from a West, Western perspective, an Islamic government uh, had um, carrying lots of etiquettes behind them uh, because of the 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 prejudices right. uh, hegemonic in the West. Right. Uh, but of course, there is a danger that they can go to, 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 to an authoritarian way. Uh, this is a possibility. I can see that there is a risk. Um, but it's still a risk. You don't think that line has been irretrievably crossed yet? No, because uh, I can see that Erdogan Mm, can try to make a kind of uh, a second republic uh, like, like and like Kemal, like Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, like his Kemalism, his that big uh, principles uh, like uh, coming from the heaven, he can make this uh, and he can return this to an Erdoganism. There is a risk about this because his mentality is not democratic, I believe. But there is a hope that the world is changing and Turkey is changing and Turkish so sociology is changing. Uh, and there is internet, there is uh, media, uh, and there is a transformation going on there. And the maybe toothpaste is out of its tube that you cannot uh, send it back. Uh, that's why I have the hope that Turkish society with its different elements, of course, including us, the Armenians, uh, can say uh, stop, can halt this process. And, and I hope that as well, uh, the Muslim majority itself, in, in itself, uh, have more pluralistic than, uh, than the past. So uh, someday, uh, some groups, some uh, circles can say that Erdogan, your time is over and we will uh, create a more democratic, uh, Islamic, conservative discourse in, in, for our country, and it will help for all of us, of course. Well, you talk, uh, you, you've just referred to the sort of enormous changes uh, back and forth. I mean, sort of forward and back and to the side that uh, 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 Turkey has gone through since the founding of the republic in uh, 1923. Yeah. Uh, Let's talk now about Armenians mm -hmm. and whether they've gone through many changes. So I'll, 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 I'll give you a very pointed question. Uh, in fact, when uh, Salpi and I met 30-some uh, uh, odd years ago, it was an interesting time in the Armenian diaspora because it was a moment where uh, 
every, not everywhere, but in many places from Lebanon to Los Angeles, there was actually sm very small uh, armed groups who were um, assassinating uh, Turkish uh, uh, officials. They consider themselves to be in armed conflict with the Turks. Uh, and Turkey is usually a pretty bad word at, a, at an Armenian dinner uh, or lunch. Uh, is Turkey the enemy still of Armenians? I know that in this you'll also answer, uh, you'll also address to what degree the Turks have or have not begun to at least recognize the existence of the genocide. But should Armenians at this point in 2015, 100 years afterwards, see Turkey as the primary adversary in their, mm -hmm. in their world? Yeah. Uh, Turkey can be enemy for the Armenians for political reasons, but I'm sure that Turks are not. Yes. That's the important point, I believe. And my answer for this question is, of course, Turkey is not enemy for the Armenians. And I will explain this. Uh, there was a genocide, a huge crime against all humanity, and the victims were the one and a half million Armenians who were massacred, killed, deported, uprooted, annihilated in their own, from their own lands. And Turkish Republic was established after this crime, and we can say that Turkish national economy uh, comes from there. And Turkish bourgeoisie emerged from the uh, Armenian money, Armenian land, Armenian households. Uh, and this history was denied for 100 years. Uh, and no Turkish government said that to, even today it was a, government, it was a genocide. Uh, this is truth. Uh, this is the reality. Uh, and Turkish state is for me now, today, trying to edit its stance about the Armenian genocide because there, was, there is a lot of pressure on them and this pressure is coming from inside and outside. And that's why they know that the old lies cannot be find its uh, market. Right. Uh, the condolences message that Prime Minister Erdogan gave last year, of course, was an important step. What was that exactly? Uh, the message just before the anniversary of the Armenian genocide at April 23rd, one day before the anniversary, saying that lots of Armenians were <laughs> deported and killed during the time of World War I, like many others in the Ottoman Empire. So a very mild statement, but, yeah. a, but a, a gentle, recognition that something happened. Yeah, something happened. Some people died. It's, <laughs> it's, it's uh, from some, some bizarre... Or as uh, President uh, Obama said, we tortured some folks. Yeah. <laughs> some uh, folks but were tortured. Of course, this is not enough. Uh, nobody can say that this is enough. It's, uh, it's not satisfactory, but uh, from a Turkish perspective, if you look at from this history, from, this, uh, from the perspective of this history, it's a huge step. Because at the end, uh, we like it or not, the politicians are tied with the public opinion. And we know that uh, for historical and realistic reasons, Turkish public opinion uh, doesn't believe that there was a genocide. They don't? No, because for generations, generation after generation, textbooks uh, we're saying that there wasn't a genocide. The Armenians of Ottoman Empire uh, worked with the Russian army during the World War I. They uh, cooperated with them, and they stepped their nation, the Ottoman nation, from the back. And then the Ottoman government decided to deport them under safe uh, uh, circumstances uh, to a safety place. And that's all. And the genocide was an imperialist lie. With about, uh, I'm, of course, quoting these textbooks. And the Turkish young people, the children, were educated with this, uh, let's say, belief. Uh, that's why 
I can say that Turkey state can be enemy, but Turks not. Because from my perspective, and I know these people, I'm living with them, uh, in their spirit, they are innocent. Because Correct. believe that uh, or imagine that uh, in the textbooks in the US, uh, there are these kind of stories about Native Americans. And they are saying that no, no crime, no massacre, no uh, bad things, only uh, they stepped uh, Spaniards from the back or Irish people from the back, and that's why they faced some pr trouble. Um, the important thing is, uh, at these last 20 years, uh, after 90s, uh, Turks, Kurds, and Armenians started to rewrite this history from a different perspective. Uh, lots of Turkish intellectuals and uh, most, of, most people from the Kurdish regions are accepting the genocide. Uh, and this story is a new phenomenon for, for most of the Turks. Uh, the, 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 even the intellectuals who are, let's say, over 50, uh, cannot f first, when they heard that there was a genocide, when they read Agos, Rantings articles, or said, or uh, read Tanrak Cham's books speaking about the genocide, they were shocked because it's, it was new for them. And unfortunately, uh, the assassination of the Asala Armenian organizations, organization that killed the Turkish diplomats, uh, in the in 70s, 1970s until 1984-5, uh, for the most of the Turks, the first time they met uh, with the claim that there was a genocide, and for them it was shocking because why these bloody armies are killing our diplomats? They were thinking. Right. This is this is their perspective, and it's not easy to move from there, uh, but we gained some ground in Turkey. Uh, Turkish social um, opposition gained the ground about the Armenian issue, and uh, one of the last uh, polls about the Armenian genocide, made, uh, which made two months ago, saying that 18% of the Turkish society uh, is believing that there was a genocide. And we, from, I believe that from uh, 90s, we moved from zero to 18 percent, so we have to move on. Uh, but uh, we need a democratic space to discuss this. If no democracy in Turkey, it will be impossible to to go on about the Armenian. Well, that puts the that puts uh, Armenians, uh, especially those in the in the diaspora, those who don't live in Turkey. Mm -hmm. uh, it puts them in a difficult. Uh, psychological position because you said that well the Turkish people are not the enemy the Turkish government can be the enemy but I think you just said you just implied that it benefits Armenians and everybody else to encourage a democrat more democratization of the Turkish government that's what you're saying isn't it yeah uh, I will exaggerate and uh, say that uh, what is good for a Turk is good for an Armenian. Uh, because democracy is good for, for Turks <laughs> yes. and for everybody around the world. And without the democracy in Turkey, there will be no genocide recognition, I can say. Mm -hmm. a, a, a closed or more, a more nationalist, a more militaristic Turkey will never accept that there was a genocide, but, but a more open, more pluralistic, uh, more liberal Turkey, at the end, I believe that, and, and I'm sure that, at the end, will recognize the genocide. Mm -hmm. uh, the later on think... Uh, but it goes deeper than recognize, uh, recognizing the genocide. The is, recognizing is the genocide will be a result of, of all the democracy. Right, but that, that's not the end of the process. That's, sure. a, that's a precondition for a greater reconciliation, right? Because you can't have the reconciliation if there's a denial of history. But the recognition itself uh, isn't 
enough, is it? Because I, as I said to you before our public talk here, that in reading about uh, Germany, um, Germany was militarily defeated in World War II, and it was forced. There, it was forced to uh, to recognize the Holocaust, um, and it did. There were certain denazification laws that sort of worked and sort of didn't. But if you really read, you see that 40, 50 years after the war, after the recognition. Uh, you don't find Germans who deny the Holocaust, but you find Germans who say, oh, we had, nobody knew, right? So there is a recognition, but there is not always a very deep and fundamental change of attitude of those consequences. Ma'am, do you see something similar? In yeah, yeah. It's the same. Uh, I was saying that the later on thing was asking a question when uh, he go out the country and for instance speak with a diasporan Armenian group. Uh, he was asking that do you prefer a democratic Turkey or do you prefer a Turkey recognizes genocide upon outside pressure? And I believe that this is a very correct ethical question and this can show, show us lots of things. Uh, and as you said, uh, I don't believe that with, with, without an inner change, inner spiritual mentality, uh, not spiritual, inner change in mentality and the perception of history, uh, cannot be a there cannot be a recognition and no government uh, can dare to accept it. Because if the society rejects, the, the party in power will reject it and this is very normal. Uh, that's why uh, the, the allies of Turkey, U.S. or other countries, or Armenian diaspora, or Armenians, about this issue, about the Armenian genocide recognition issue, issue for me, uh, I believe that must be more clever, more smart, and create, must create new strategies. And these strategies must be only uh, come from a democratic mind. Uh, not from a perspective of punishing uh, Turks or the Turkish state. Uh, reconciliation cannot be with the punishment. Reconciliation cannot be with a defeat. Reconciliation must have two sides, and these two sides and are Turks and Armenians now. And at the end, if the recognition will come, Turks must feel a kind of proud about this. Not a guilt, but a Proud must be there for the Turks. Otherwise, they will always they, they will they will always reject it. Well, it's a very uh, it's a provocative uh, thesis that you put forward. How does this? Uh, you've been visiting here. Uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, uh, you said there are fifty thousand uh, Armenians in Turkey. I believe there is. 200,000 in greater Los Angeles? Is that right? I don't no? know. Maybe more. More. And I think my figures are out of date. Uh, maybe 300 or 400,000. Uh, but this is one of the biggest cities of Armenia, uh, as it is where this also the second city of El Salvador. Uh, uh, how does this discourse of yours resonate among the Armenians you found here when you tell them, you know, um, you, it, I mean, you, you, you use the term, I know how you used it. You, you said, you know, the Armenian, the, the Turks have to come to a position of actually feeling some pride in recognizing and accepting this conciliation. That's a hard thing for an Ar Armenian to hear it. I'm not even an Armenian. Uh, how, did, how does that resonate? Do you, do you find that people, your fellow Armenians, understand that or not? No, of course I, I can understand that this is hard for most of the Armenians around the world. Uh, and maybe they, some of them are believing that I'm speaking like this because I'm coming from Turkey and I'm under pressure, but this is not the issue, of course. Uh, I like Milan Kundera too much. 
And one of the, his novels, one of the, his, his best uh, was The Joke. And in The Joke, written in the 60s, I think, yeah. uh, the Ludwig, the main character, uh, send a, sends a postcard, uh, including a joke about the regime, about the communist regime. And because only for that one sentence, uh, he get out of the party, out of the university, he get prisoned for 10 years with hard working, etc. He, there was this, the system and his friends, of course, because they complained to, to him, to the state, uh, he lost, lost everything. And for 20 or 30 years, uh, he dreams about uh, facing that people who raise tents for the for sending him out of the party and for from the university. You're looking for revenge. Yes, a, a revenge facing them, and he was dreaming lots of things to say, and he will be cursed, etc. But when 20 years later he faces some of his old friends, <laughs> uh, he saw he sees that. They are changed, and they are now against the system, uh, and they are in the opposition. They are very really anti-communist, uh, and they feel a kind of sorry about their past. And this creates a huge disappointment for the <laughs> Ludwig and a, a void, a huge void uh, inside him because he needs that revenge to, to go on, to live, and it, it's, it becomes very hard to continue after that because he loses the possibility of taking a revenge. Uh, and this is, the hard, uh, this is a very hard position. Uh, Turkey is not there. Turkey is not there, but Turkey is changing. And I believe that Armenians must at least think about the possibility of uh, a peaceful future for, with the Turks and a peace, uh, a possible reconciliation, and what will happen after that for their identity personally and uh, in general. Because, of course, it is true and it's very right, it's very just that the Armenian genocide and the denial of the genocide is one of the key elements of the Armenian ident identity. It's very normal because Turks are denying it for 100 years. but. An identity, it's not healthy to have an identity based on the denial. Our main identity is very rich uh, and ha have to do lots of things for the future. And it cannot be at the end of a denial state which denies the historical fact. Uh, but uh, that's why I believe that Armenians, as you said, uh, must find a way to affect Turkey to change its direction to a real democracy. This is the more healthy and fruitful way, uh, I believe. This gave the burden to the Armenians. This is unjust, I believe, I, I know that. But if the change is demanded by the Armenians, Armenians must to do something. Of course, it, Turks must to do something, <laughs> yeah. but in their share, uh, the old discourses, old mentalities, all, old strategies cannot go on for the Armenians as well, not for the Turks only. Well, I, I was looking at the clock over there, but it's wrong. Uh, so uh, it looks like we have to give up the room in a minute. Uh, Robert, thank you so much. I really learned a lot today from you. Thank uh, you so much, Mike. And uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Who said life is fair, right? No. Um, I just want to add something because I always think that often in these really complex gray conversations, we end up talking to ourselves because we live with the 55 facets of this every blasted day in different ways. And I just want to add something that is obvious, maybe, and that is that what has happened over these 100 years is that rather than having the space to deal with perpetrators, victims, some saviors, and to deal with the complexity that that already presents, 
You know, were the Armenians who were Islamized and kept in Turkey, were they saved or were they abused? How do you look at all of these questions? And it's complex enough. And then when you put on top of that the denial by a state apparatus that has unlimited resources to quench both these survivors and these survivors, you end up with a situation where we now, wanting, I think, an end to all of this so that we can rebuild culture and identity and all of that, we end up in a, I end up in a position where I need to defend my grandmother and explain to the world that you know what, she's not a liar. Everything she lived was true, despite what Erdogan and all of his predecessors say. Given that context, so much of this conversation almost seems hoo hoo, high in the sky. And yet, if my, forget my children, my grandchildren aren't going to have to keep fighting this battle, somebody's going to have to push this to a conclusion. It might as well be us. We seem to be smarter. So it's, I mean, I was sitting there listening from, you know, maybe somebody else's set of ears and thinking, man, how do you, how do you digest this? But I just want to say I really appreciate that you both went into really difficult territory. And whether we individually or collectively agree with all of it or none of it or some of it, that we need, this is the year that's going to force us to keep talking about this. So thank you. Thank you, Robert, for not just saying what you say, but living the life that you live. You are... You know, Robert has often said during these two weeks, you know, we talk about survivors and we think that's me. That's really him. Um, and thank you, Mark, for, as always, giving things context. Thank you, and thank you to all of you. It's not over yet. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.